thank you for sticking around and who are coming. Uh, this is the Fulbright U.S. Student Program Research and Study Grant specific uh, info session. Um, so just quickly, uh, a review. Uh, the grants can be independent study or independent research or university study. Uh, and the specifics do depend on the country. Uh, read the website, make sure you know what they're looking for. And the award itself will have, uh, the application itself will have six components uh, that you will need to be aware of. Ooh, it's out of order and weird, I need to fix that later. Also, there's a community engagement aspect of it too, along with the research that you're doing. Um, so keep all of those things in mind. Um, okay, so this is where I'll start to get into the specifics of the application, what it looks like, what you should be thinking about um, as you're going through it next comparing it. I'll also say, too, that we do have sample winning essays from previous years. Um, you can pick them up from us. We have them as paper copies, uh, not as digital copies, so you'll have to come here and get them. Um, and also because they are, um, because they are rather large, I don't really have any on hand, but if you let me know, if you send me an email and say, I want to pick up one of these sample essay packets, I can print it out, I can have it ready for you, and then you can just stop by and the exchange will take a minute. Um, but they're good, they're good to read, they're very helpful. Um, so the project statement will be two pages, single spaced. So some of the things that you'll want to be thinking about explaining in your project statement. One of the things is why does it have to be this country? Um, every country that you're applying to, they want to feel special. They want to feel like, you know, you want to be there and not anywhere else. Uh, sometimes this is uh, very easy. Um, you know, if you have done a lot of research on uh, Japan, um, and it's been specific to Japan, you know, your application will be for Japan, and that's fine. Um, looking at Latin America, though, the way Pitt handles Latin America, sometimes it's sort of a pan Latin American studies, and so you might not have that same degree of specialization. So if you're picking Colombia over Ecuador, over Argentina, over Chile, wherever, you need to be able to articulate why you've made that choice. Um, and so sometimes, too, also, when you're talking about um, why it has to be that country, you can even talk about you know, maybe some of the background of your subject in that country. So if um, there's been a long academic history of that, um, if there's been recent legislation that's been passed that makes your subject relevant in that country, you can say that. Um, because, uh, I should also say too, while you do want to give the impression that you can't do your research anywhere else and it has to be there, it is kind of true that a lot of research can be tweaked and applied to other countries. That's fine, that's understandable, but you just want to make them think that you know, this is the, the place you have to be. Um, so don't, don't be concerned if your research can be one of multiple places. Just make the argument that it has to be that country. So what are you doing? How, when, uh, how and when will you um, so that means a couple of things. One is that you will want to be able to describe what your research is. Um, also, your project will be read um, by people who are not necessarily experts in your field. Um, science applications typically are read by scientists, but they might not be your scientist. It might be a marine biologist reading a chemical engineering application. Um, so they'll be knowledgeable of science, but maybe not your science. Similarly, if you're a social scientist or someone in the humanities, you'll maybe have someone who is in the social science or humanities reading your application, but they might not be your specific discipline. So when you're talking about what you're doing, you want to balance it kind of between um, making sure that anyone would be able to understand it, but not talking down to the reader as well. They're still going to be uh, professors. They're still going to be intelligent people. So when you're talking about what you're doing, you, know, you have to walk that line. And then how and when will you do it? Um, the when is kind of like the timeline. You want to be able to say what the overall project will look like over the course of that year. Um, so during month one, I will be doing this. Then during months two through four, I will be doing this. Um, it is a nine to 10 month program. It's based on the academic year of the country to which you're applying. And so they want to know that you are filling that space. You are not. Uh, coming up with something that's too large or too small fits within the nine to ten months. Um, and then the how will you do it? That's important as well. So if you say, 
You know, I want to find out how people feel about um, the recent elections in the country. Um, okay, well, how do you find out how they feel about that? What's your methodology? Um, and you really want to think about that and what that means. Um, so if you say, okay, well, I want to find out how people feel about the recent election, and so I'm going to talk to people about it. Okay, well, how many people are you going to talk to about it? Uh, how are you going to conduct those conversations? Is there a questionnaire involved? If there is a questionnaire, how will you determine the questions? What's your sample size? Um, so all of that, as many questions as you can answer, uh, the more questions you can answer, the better. Um, so sometimes, too, it might not even, you might not even need to think as much about the methodology if you are, say, maybe working in a laboratory that has a preset uh, program, but even still, you want to say how that project is done, how that work is done over the course of that year. Um, and if you are applying to a, um, a university study, your how and when, that will be just what the program looks like. So instead of having a timeline, you'll describe the academic structure. Um, does it have semesters? Does it have trimesters? Um, is there a master's thesis involved? Will you be taking classes and then just do the thesis in the second half? Will you be expected to be working on the thesis over the whole time? Um, is it a research-based degree? So maybe you don't really take classes and you don't have a thesis, but you're conducting research in an academic setting. So all of those questions would have to be answered because, again, the reader doesn't necessarily have knowledge of the academic program to which you'd be applying. So you also want to explain why you should be the one to do your project. You know, by this point, hopefully you've convinced them that it has to be done in this country. There's something very relevant in that country that necessitates your project being carried out there. Um, and that the project itself is very relevant. Um, that it's something that the world needs and it's feasible and you can carry out the timeline. But then the you has to be explained. So what coursework have you taken? Um, what research have you previously done? Um, Maybe what sort of extracurricular activities have you done outside of that? Um, things like that. You know, how can you convince them in the, the course of this paper that you can do the things that you said should be done? Um, you know, what else will you do is another thing that will be a part of the project statement. Um, this is the community engagement aspect. Um, this can be an extension of your research if you want, but it doesn't have to be. We had a bioengineer apply to go to Australia, Australia a couple of years ago. Um, he was working uh, with the blind community and on devices for the blind community. Uh, for his what else will you do section, he said, I'm a musician. I plan to bring a guitar with me, and I want to network within the music scene uh, and meet people that way. And that was fine. He won the award. Um, so that was one example of community engagement. Um, they do also like service and volunteerism, so if you typically, you know, Participate in service or volunteerism, you can think about doing that while you're abroad, too. I also plan to you know, teach English lessons on the side. Um, I plan to volunteer um, at a, uh, maybe a women's shelter, people have said in the past. So whatever volunteering you might want to do, think about, is it in that country, does it exist, and can you do that? And then finally, the last thing you'd want to explain in your project statement is what comes after the full plan. And how does this fit into your goals? So will you be going to industry? Will you be going to grad school? Will you be going somewhere else? Um, and how does this specific project act as the bridge between your undergraduate and whatever comes next? Um, they do want to see that it's connected. They do want to make sure that they're participating. Um, if you're unsure about what comes next, but you have a couple of ideas, you can say that. But they just want to make sure that you're not treating the full right as uh, a vacation before you start your real life. Uh, real being quotes. Uh, so the personal statement is the next document. It's one page, single space, so it's a little shorter than the project statement. This one winds up being a little bit harder to talk about than the project statement. The project statement has definitive chunks, but this is harder to talk about because it's about who you are as a person. Um, so it's the things that are important to you, that matter to you, that make you and that's why I can't be as prescriptive with this document as I can with the project statements. Um, but you don't want to focus on who you are as an applicant. This is not about wowing them and demonstrating to them that you are perfect for the Fulbright. It is showing them just who you are. It should be a conversation of sorts with them. Um, 
by and large, there are no um, interviews for the Fulbright. There are a handful of countries who do, and if you're applying to one of those countries, we'll let you know. Um, but most people will not be interviewed for the Fulbright. And so this kind of serves as your interview. This is how they get a sense of who you are, what's important to you. It's also not a pro's resume. You do not want to go through the personal statement and say, I was the president of SGB, I founded this club, I volunteer inside, and that is who I am. You can talk about any of those experiences, but you don't just want to leave it at, I did this thing for this day. Instead, you would want to talk about why you did that thing in the first place. Why was it important for you? What did you gain by doing that thing? Um, how will that impact your future? How did it change the way you think about your future? Again, this is how they get to know you. Uh, and kind of on that line, too, it must be memorable. Um, so you want to think about how you stand out. And one of the ways that to be memorable is with specifics. Um, by being as specific about who you are, what you've done, what's as important to you, uh, those sorts of details are going to be the things that people who are in your field but are other people will not have and will not be able to say. Um, I'd say don't be, don't be scared about that memorable aspect at this stage. We can sort of help you uh, work through that. Um, we've certainly heard a lot of people say things like, well, I just had a normal upbringing. Um, I, how am I going to make this memorable? I just had a normal childhood. And we'll say, well, what does normal mean to you? What does that mean? Um, we've had applicants who have spent their childhood traveling the world with maybe military families or families who work in industry and they're shipped around. Um, we've had people who you know, have been raised in very rural areas and maybe didn't have TV and spent their whole childhood just imagining this and that. Um, so, and you know, both types of people have said, well, my, my childhood was just normal. Um, so don't. Uh, don't worry about that right now because, you know, the definitions of memorable and unmemorable uh, aren't set in stone. We can help you figure out what might be good to put in there. So additionally, there's the letter of affiliation. This is the third uh, component of the application. Uh, and I'll start by saying what it is. Uh, it's a professional connection that assists you in your research. That is a very kind of vague description of what the... Uh, the affiliate is in this letter of affiliation. Um, it's kind of intentionally vague. Um, the professional connection that is relevant for one field is not going to be the same sort of connection that's relevant for another field. And so Fulbright mostly wants to see that you are connecting with someone who can help you complete your research project. Um, so for example, if you're in the theater arts, that figure might not be the same as who a chemist might seek, who a sociologist might seek. So they want you to just seek out whomever is uh, relevant for your work. Um, so the letter of affiliation also is proof that you can begin working right away. This is why it's important to have an affiliate. Because the Fulbright's only nine months or so, uh, they don't want you wasting any time getting into the country and thinking, okay, well, how am I going to do this? Who's going to help me out? How am I going to meet people? Um, by having the affiliation established beforehand, they know that once you get to the country, once you get settled in your new apartment, you can go up to that affiliate and say, okay, I'm ready to start working. How do we do this? And they can help you network. They can help you with guidance. They can help you with things like that. Um, so the affiliates, uh, they can be anyone in your profession. Asterisk. Um, I say asterisk because, like many other things, the country has the ability to specify who you can and cannot work with. Um, the most common specification we'll see is that a country may say that your affiliate has to be someone associated with an educational institution. Uh, so some sort of professor, or if they're a researcher that's attached to an academic institution. Um, countries will often specify that that person has to be your affiliate. Otherwise, if that's not the case, it just has to be someone who is appropriate to get your work done. That could be maybe a government official. That could be maybe an NGO worker. That could be some other sort of, if it's in the arts, a creative arts professional. Um, there are lots of different people, and we can sit down and talk with you about who might be a good idea in terms of conceptually. Um, and you can also have multiple affiliates too. So if you're if you have a uh, sort of multi-pronged project that examines how the government and NGOs work together to provide services, 
you can have a government uh, affiliate and an NGO affiliate. It's perfectly acceptable, but you do need at least one. The letter that they give you must state uh, a couple of things. One, who the individual is. I am Dr. So-and-so, I work at this institution, this is the sort of work that I do. How your interests overlap. So, why, they kind of have to explain in their letter why you sought them out. What are they doing that's, you know, relevant to your interests? How is what you're proposing to do relevant to their interests and profession? That connection needs to be established and why they were chosen as your affiliate. They need to talk about how they will support you. And this come back, comes back to the idea that the affiliate can be anyone, and that all sorts of different fields will be asking all sorts of different people. So are they giving you access to their research facility? Are they giving you an office space? They're giving you a desk and an internet connection and a telephone. Are they helping you network within a certain population? Um, whatever they may be doing, are they giving you access to uh, records that they have? Whatever it is, they'll have to spell that out. And then finally, they have to express enthusiasm for you winning the Fulbright. Um, it sounds like this would be self-evident based on the fact that they're actually writing this letter and inviting you to do work with them, but it's still important that they say something like, we really love Ross's project, we hope he comes down here and begin working on it, we really want him to win the Fulbright. Um, so showing that enthusiasm is important. So, uh, the letters of affiliation, how do you go about getting this letter? You know, uh, how do you find that person abroad, and how do you get them to respond to you? One of the best ways to start is with the on-campus network. So if you are looking to go to Greece and you are studying under a faculty member who's done extensive work in Greece, talk to that faculty member. They might have someone who can, they might have a colleague who they can connect to. Um, even if the person is slightly outside of your on-campus network, maybe you haven't met them before, but maybe you're doing work relevant to theirs and you know that they have international connections, you can introduce yourself. Say, hi, I'm Ross. Uh, we haven't met before, but I'm interested in the work that you do, and I'm also interested in doing work in the country that you've often done work in. Can we talk about that? Can we talk about who I might want to affiliate with? Uh, so that might be a way to do it as well. Um, this may even also open you up to actually new countries that you haven't considered, uh, particularly in the sciences. I think people in the sciences have a lot more flexibility because often, more often than not, language requirements aren't required for people in the sciences. So you might find out that your PI or someone working in a neighboring lab has a connection in Singapore. Maybe you've never thought about going to Singapore. And suddenly if they're saying, yeah, no, 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 I have a really great friend, we can hook you up, they're, they're doing exactly the same sort of research. So maybe suddenly you're thinking, could I spend a year in Singapore? What would that be like? Do I want to do that? So it's interesting how this process can help you kind of shape what you're doing and where you would go. The internet is also a great tool for this process and many other processes. Um, by that, by the internet, I mean, if you know where you want to go, and you know what you want to do, if you know you want to do bioengineering in Germany, you can Google bioengineering in Germany. Um, that could be just a way to start. Um, but, you know, beyond that, more specifically, if you know that you want to be in a city or an area in a certain country, you can look at the educational institutions in that country. So then you can see, okay, what departments do they have that would overlap with what I want to do? Once you find those departments, what professors are in those departments? And are, are there any professors in those departments who are doing the sorts of things that I want to do? And if there is, if there are, that's suddenly a connection that you might want to seek out. Write them an email and talk about that. Um, and then the Fulbright itself is a good way to find affiliates. And I will explain that now in greater depth. Um, so I'm going to make sure this works. Try to do a handy little movie. Um, before I actually click on that or click on anything, um, the Fulbright Scholar Program, this is their website. Um, I believe it's just cides.org. Um, I mentioned before that in order to apply for the Fulbright U.S. Student Program, you can't have a terminal degree. Um, the Fulbright Scholar Program is for people who have that terminal degree. So once you get a PhD, MD, DO, whatever it might be, there's this other program that you can apply for if you want. It's basically the same idea, international exchange, to conduct research, uh, and to network with other uh, cultures, but it's just for people who are professionals in their field. So how does this help? Um, well, it means that there are people who are professors in other countries who are already sympathetic and enthused about the program. So if you can find people in the country that you want to go to who are doing things similar to what you want to do, 
who have participated in this program, who have come to the US for a year to study and then gone back home, they might be a more receptive audience if you send them an email out of the blue talking about the program. Um, so this is uh, the CIDS site. Let me see if I can get this little video thing to play. If I can, uh, it will show you how to find that directory. Is it going? Is it working? Yeah, here we go. So um, you will want to click on View the Fulbright Scholars Directory, the arm flashing thing there. So you click it. Wait, and this site loads up. So this is the Fulbright Scholar Directory. You'll scroll, you want to go to Advanced Filters, and you will want to actually also click Non-US, parenthetical Visiting Scholar, that means people who've come to the US. Then you'll go to Program Country, and that's all the, all the countries that the Scholar Program exists in. Um, so you can select whichever country you know you want to go to. For the purposes of this, let's just say Denmark. And then you click Search. You scroll down again once it loads. And so this is everyone from, the De from Denmark who's participated in the Fulbright Scholar Program. Um, you can reorganize the group. Here I've just reorganized it based on year, so you can see who's come most recently. You can also reorganize it based on discipline. So if you do that, okay, uh, and you scroll down, you can see the fields of all these people in alphabetical order. And you can see if any of them match your field. Um, Right, and so if you click their names too, you get more information about them. Uh, so this person was in urban development and planning at Aalborg University. So if I was interested in urban development and planning in Denmark, I could look up this person's profile on Aalborg site and then potentially reach out and make contact with them. Uh, so that might be a good way to start. Maybe this person isn't interested, but maybe they'll say my colleague would love to work with you. There's the address, CIES. Okay, um, another way to look for affiliates is to look for people who have previously won the uh, U.S. student program, the program that you're applying for. Um, so you want to think about potentially people from America who have gone to the country that you want to go to. And the line of questioning that you can have with them is something like, hey, I, you know, we're in similar fields. Who did you seek out as an affiliate? Uh, do you think they'd be amenable to being an affiliate again? Um, would you recommend them as an affiliate? Did you have a good year working with them? And so the way to do that, let's once again see if this works. Okay. Here we go. So you'll want to click Grantee Directory. The words are very small, but they're up there in the top right corner. Grantee Directory. So you will click that. There it is. Yeah, there we go. And it will take you to this site. This is the Grantee Directory. Um, you'll want to go down again to Country. So you'll select the country that you want to apply to. Uh, this will be a list of all the U.S. students who have applied to, or who have won grants to that country. So uh, for the purposes of this, let's say Brazil. Then you click search. And again, much like the other, uh, other thing, it gives you a full list of who's won grants to Brazil and spent time in Brazil. You can sort them by field of study again. And so let's say, you know, we're looking at Agriculture, maybe. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, agriculture, right. So when you click on someone's name, beyond just agriculture, it gives you more specifically what they worked on. So this was environmental and economic impacts of Amazonian payment for ecosystem services programs. So if that's similar to what you're doing, you can reach out to that person and ask them about their experience. Um, Um, right, so that's that. Um, the other thing, the, the unfortunate thing about this though is that Fulbright does not give you their contact information, so you have to do some internet snooping in order to reach out to them. Um, usually Googling their name plus Fulbright or their name plus Fulbright plus country will result in uh, some sort of contact info. Most people wind up having blogs. Uh, maybe on Facebook you can find them too. Um, maybe that sounds weird to do, but we did have someone from Fulbright come uh, a year or two ago to give an info session, and they suggested doing the same thing. So it is a Fulbright-approved method of internet stalking. Um, and that's their website. It's us.fulbrightonline.org. So the next portion is the letters of recommendation. Three letters are required. At least two of them have to be from professors. Um, 
and that is professors and not grad students. Um, I'll get to that in a second. The third can also be from a professor. Um, if it's not, it must be someone who's relevant to your project. Uh, so whether it's from an internship coordinator, whether it's from uh, maybe someone you've done research under, a co-op, someone who's done a co-op, that's all fine. Um, but it has to be relevant to the project that you're proposing. Um, professors, you do actually have some leeway. You certainly do want people who can speak to your ability to get it done. But maybe in the third letter, if it's a professor, the professor can be from a different field. If you're a chemical engineer, but your third letter is from a history professor who knows you very well, that's fine. Um, so there's some flexibility with that third letter in that sense. As I mentioned, no grad students, but there's an asterisk to that. Um, typically, they don't want you getting letters from grad students because you're competing against graduate students. Um, but the asterisk means if there is a situation, some sort of extenuating circumstance whereby a grad student was your instructor and they were really the only one who can comment on your ability to do that thing on campus, that's maybe where it would be okay. An example of this was a couple of years ago, uh, there was a grad student at Pitt who taught Mongolian. She was one of two people in the Pittsburgh area who spoke Mongolian, and the only person directly affiliated with the university who spoke and taught Mongolian. In that instance, if someone was applying to Mongolia, a letter from her is wholly appropriate, because there's no one else on campus that you could have ostensibly worked with who could also comment. But if it's something like French, um, you know, there are lots of grad students who teach French 1 and 2, but they want you to be connecting with the higher faculty as well. So in that instance, uh, the grad students would not be uh, preferred. The people should know you well, also. They should be able to comment on you as a person, on, your, on the specifics of your work, on the specifics of work that you've had in class. So you really want to think, who knows, who can really use specifics in a letter um, for this application? Finally, there are directions on the scholarship website uh, for letters of recommendation. We do recommend that you go back and you read those if you haven't recently. Um, in short, what it says, it says a couple of things. You want to give at least two to three months notice. You do want to follow up with a packet of information about yourself when you're getting letters. Um, the packet will have all sorts of information, even things that uh, should be seemingly obvious. Things like the amount of time that the person has known you, the ways in which they know you, Maybe I'm your, uh, I conduct research under you, I'm your TA. Uh, you want to remind them of all of these things. Um, and then you can give them other details, but do look at that online. Um, the language evaluations is going to be the next portion that I'll talk about. Again, these are not mandatory, um, but if the country requires them, you should have one. If you have language skill in that country, even if it doesn't require it, you should get a language evaluation anyway. It puts you that much above your competitors to be able to say, you know, I know this country doesn't require the language, um, but I know the language, and I have this skill that maybe many of my competitors don't. So you must arrange these well in advance. Um, there are a limited number of people who can perform them on campus, um, and so you want to make sure, we want to make sure that we're not flooding their office at the end of summer with 50 people suddenly knocking on their door to uh, conduct language evaluation. Um, so instead, you can start talking about these maybe in early May, maybe in June. Um, you don't need to actually have the evaluation in June, but in June, but just start the scheduling process. Send an email out in May or June that says, "Hey, I need a language evaluation for the Fulbright. Will you be able to do that? If so, when are you free over the summer? Can we do it when I come back?" Things like that. It's usually the director of the language program on campus who will give that. Um, and so by director of the language program, I don't necessarily mean the chair of the department. Um, Hispanic languages and literature is a good example. So there is the chair of uh, Hispanic languages and literature. I believe it's Dr. Balderson. Dr. Balderson is not the person you would want to contact. Instead, you would want to contact uh, Dr. Nardoni uh, if you're studying Spanish. If you're studying Portuguese or getting a Portuguese evaluation, you'd want to have um, Professor Carvalho do your evaluation. Evaluators can also be recommenders, um, so they can write a letter of recommendation for you and also do the language evaluation. If that is the case, there's a small technical glitch in which they'll need two email addresses in order to sign up for the system. 
Fulbright lets the same person have multiple roles, but the electronic system does not let one email address have multiple roles. That's a small thing. We can talk about that when it actually comes up. I'll just give you a hands up about that now. A low rating on a language evaluation is better than no rating. So even if you're just a beginner in the language, the evaluation could potentially say something like, Ross is a beginner in the language. However, he's already come this far with this limited amount of study, and we think that between the time the application is submitted and the time he goes abroad, he will be able to advance further and he'll be fine when he gets to the country. Um, and you can also submit relevant evaluations even if they're not required. Um, so if you are going to um, Switzerland, you know Swiss, you also know French, you can have two language evaluations. You can have Swiss and French testing. Um, so even if it says you only need to know one of the country's primary languages, if you have multiple skills, flaunt them. Show them that you have these skills. Okay. So next up is transcripts. This is another component of the application. You will need all of your undergraduate transcripts. Um, this includes study abroad transcripts. This includes uh, any institutions that you might have transferred in from. They can be unofficial, technically. Uh, if possible, you should get the official transcripts anyway. The reason we want you to get official transcripts is because if you are a Fulbright finalist, they will request that you send them official transcripts. There's typically a very short turnaround period between finding out you're a finalist and them saying, give us your transcripts. Um, and some, particularly study abroad institutions, but some institutions are take a notoriously long time to give you transcripts. Uh, I know Sciences Po in France takes like six months to give people transcripts. Um, so if you know that's the case, just get a copy of them now. Uh, and then if you're a finalist, you'll have them on hand and you don't have to stress out. If you don't become a finalist, you'll have them on hand and you can use them for some other opportunity. They must be legible. You want to make sure about that. So um, when you scan them, sometimes it'll say void all over it. You want to make sure that whomever is reading it can actually read it. Um, Uh, it must be a document from the registrar is another important one. I know that on uh, my pit.edu, you can print out something that winds up being 20 pages that has all of your courses listed and maybe the score per page. Don't do that. Uh, it has to be actually something that sometime originated from a registrar's office. So it can be the unofficial transcripts. It can be the white copy from PIT uh, for the first deadline, but uh, it must be something from the registrar. Um, but the exception with transcripts. Exceptions can be made for individual transcripts that list fewer than 12 transfer credits or grades, and if the coursework is not relevant to your Fulbright project. So let's say you know you studied abroad in Spain, you took one, it was just one language course that you took throughout the whole semester, and your Fulbright is in Japan. You don't need those Spanish transcripts if you don't want. Let's say that uh, you know, you did, you took courses at a community college between your freshman and sophomore year. You wanted to get a math requirement out of the way, so you took a math course, but your project is in English language. You don't need to produce those transcripts. Um, however, you know, it says 12 transfer credits and if the coursework is not relevant. So if you studied abroad in Spain, if you only took one language class, you only get three credits for it, but you're applying to go to Spain, get those transcripts, even though it's less, fewer than 12 transfer credits. So additional tips for compiling the application. Uh, again, read the website. I said this, I know, about an hour ago, but I'll say it again. It can't be said enough. There's so much information on their website, it's really good, especially when you're getting down to a country by country level. Um, they are very explicit about who they're looking for, what they want from their applicants. So if they say something, make sure that you have it. Um, you're all getting started pretty early now, too. So if you read a country and they say they're looking for something and you don't have it, you have time to get it. Um, so you can start building skills that you may not have currently. Think about the community aspect. Um, and not just even in terms of what, um, you know, what sort of thing would I want to do, but you can even sometimes get specific and think, how would I actually do that? So with the research project, you're applying, you get to choose where you're applying for not just the country, but you can say, I want to be in this city. And so by virtue of saying, I'm picking my place and I know where I'm going to be, 
you can start being very specific about what sort of community aspect. So if you wanted to volunteer at an after school children's program, you can start Googling and find out what sort of after school children's programs exist in that city. So then in your application you can say, I plan to volunteer with X and X blah 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 organization. And then you look very knowledgeable about uh, where you want to go. And you also look very serious because you're taking the time to research what uh, offerings are in that city. So the more research you can do on that community aspect, as well as the project that you're doing, the better. And then a couple things to be aware of, too, while you're thinking about your application and writing it. One is omission. Uh, especially in early drafts, we find, there are, uh, we find a lot of times that people will think, I'm not going to write about this because that's not a Fulbright thing. Fulbright doesn't want to know about that. Um, I think the things that Fulbright wants to know about are broader than most people would assume. Um, so, especially early on in the draft writing process, don't be afraid to go overboard. Don't be afraid to go over the page limits. Um, that's why our office is here. We're here to help you determine what is and is not uh, for the Fulbright. And it is easier for us to cut away and say that something's irrelevant than it is to imagine what sort of relevant things you might have in your past that you're not telling us. Um, so put it all out there and we can help you with that. Generalities is um, another issue. And that can take a lot of different forms. It can take generalities in terms of how you're explaining your project. Again, to go back to that idea of um, surveying that I mentioned earlier, we do have a lot of applicants who say, um, to complete my project, I will conduct surveys. So it's like, okay, well that's fine. That's certainly appropriate methodology for a number of fields, but how many surveys are you going to complete? Who are you targeting with these surveys? How do you draft those surveys? So don't just be general and say, I'm going to talk to people. I'll conduct surveys. As specific as you can get with everything, the more specific the better. Um, it can be uh, cultural generalities too. Um, the extreme version of this, uh, which unfortunately we have seen in early drafts, we will hear people say things like, I want to go to France to study abroad because I went to France when I was in high school and everything was beautiful in France and all the food was so delicious and everyone was nice to me, and so everything is great in France, and that's why I want to go. Um, you know, that, that sort of stuff is not true anywhere, so you can't just paint the country with a broad brush. A more realistic example that happened a couple years ago, or a more subtle example, um, someone was talking about going to Germany to do, um, it was mechanical engineering research that was environmentally sustainable. And they said one of the reasons they wanted to go to Germany to do this is because Germans are a very environmentally friendly um, that's even a little dicey to say when you can say something like um, the German government has taken great strides to impose uh, environmentalism. Grassroots groups have played a large part in uh, bringing environmentalism to the forefront. So saying things like that is more appropriate than just saying everyone in Germany loves the environment. Um, and finally, the project size is something that you can be aware of too. Again, it'll be nine to ten months that you'll be there. You want to fill that nine to ten months. Um, it should not be something that one could complete in two months that leaves you with seven months to hang out. It should not be something that takes five years that you're doing the first nine months of. They want you to be able to have it compact and in that uh, space. The only uh, the only thing that uh, can maybe be excluded from that is if you're doing a degree program that has a multiple multiple year degree program. So if it's a two-year degree program, that's something that can expand beyond Fulbright's project size. But that's really the only example I can think of. So what can you do now research-wise? Like I said, pick up a uh, sample essay packet. Um, you can arrange to pick that up with anyone in our office. We'll have it printed and ready to go so we can just hand it to you. It's a very easy transition that you can do between classes. You can begin writing. Um, as I said before in the last session, you know, the deadlines are going to be, the first official deadline is going to be June 1st, but you can meet with us before that. And even if with finals, if you don't have the time to meet with us before that, you can just start getting ideas on paper and start the process. Uh, but that said, you can schedule a meeting, so do get on our calendar whenever you're free, that's a great thing. Even if the meeting is not to talk about writing, even if you just have specific questions uh, that you didn't want to bring up in this session, um, you can start talking about those questions. You can ask us, you know, what we think about your candidacy. You can ask us our opinion on different countries. Um, we're happy to go through all of that. So that's something that you can do to help going through the application process. Uh, as I said earlier, you can consider strengthening your candidacy. So read over the country profiles. 
See if you're missing anything that they're explicitly looking for, and if so, ask yourself, can I legitimately get that between now and the time that I would go abroad? And if the answer is yes, start trying to get it. If the answer is no, maybe uh, schedule a meeting with us and we can talk about if that's something the country absolutely needs, uh, or if you could get by without it, or maybe you should start looking at another country. Uh, you should also meet with that campus support team that I mentioned earlier in the last session. These are the people who know your subject, who maybe know your country, who will be able to help you with those specifics that our office does not know. Um, by meeting with them, even if you don't have writing to show or discuss with them, they can even start get you started thinking about questions about how to shape your research project. Um, so that's very valuable to even start thinking about that. So you don't have to come to them with a fully formed research project that you say, what do you think of this? I have this thing that I've done on my own. You can go up to them and say, I know you've uh, consistently done work in this country. I'm interested in doing that country. I'm interested in these research themes. What do you think would be appropriate? Um, so that's the conversation can start as simply as that. So finally, again, the timeline, as I mentioned before. Tomorrow, you can register an application. We strongly recommend you do that. The personal and project statement drafts 1, 2, and 3 are due on the 1st of June, July, and August. You can meet with us more than that. You can schedule meetings between those. You can schedule meetings before those. Um, but that is the minimum that you will have to meet. Everything will be due September 1st. Everything uh, will have the interviews between September and October. We'll give you back your application. And then October 1st, everything will be due a second time. So again, if you have any questions about the research application, I'm happy to answer them now. Um, otherwise, our contact info is all there again. Um, so you can contact us. Um, otherwise, you can just schedule a meeting if you have questions, and we're happy to talk with you about them in that uh, environment. So any questions from anyone? Yes? Um, for the language you balance, is this something like the official form that Fulbright provides, or do they want, like, they want like, a tactical rating or OPI rating? So it is a form that Fulbright provides. So what you will do is, so first you'd want to reach out to the language evaluator and make sure that they're willing to do it. After you register an application, there will be a line that says, you know, who's your language evaluator, and you input their email address. After you input that, they are emailed the form that they have to fill out. So after you uh, input their address, you want to follow up with them too and say, just so you know, you should be expecting an email from Fulbright. If you don't get one, check your spam folder. Um, and it is generally based on the actual guidelines, um, but they do have a form that they want you to fill out and check it their way. Anything else? It's okay if there's not. Certainly don't want to Okay. Uh, thank you again for coming, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to work shortly on your projects.